Southeast Missouri State head coach Brad Korn. Coach, uh, just give us some general thoughts about you and your team as you uh, enter this upcoming uh, season. Yeah, you know, everybody's going to be excited about their squad at this point in the year. Uh, we're really excited just because of the guys that we brought back. A great nucleus of guys, hard workers, uh, determined to, to get the bad taste of, out of our mouth from a year ago. So they've been very focused, uh, trying to get us back to a, where we ended the year in 2023. So pleased with the new guys that came in, the production that they had uh, from junior college and portal. And then also just guys took the step that we needed to take the step this summer. Uh, so I feel it was a very productive summer. It's been a very productive preseason. And, um, you know, just like anybody else, we're now into the scrimmage and, and really get to go against another opponent and see what we're about. Since that, you say since that beginning of that that preseason till now, which hasn't been that long, but where have you all made the biggest gains in that time? Well, I don't, I don't want to keep talking about last year, um, but we were just poor in a lot of categories across the board. And we were we had we got hit by a couple injuries. We had two starters out uh, pretty much all season long. So um, but really all across the board from defensive intensity to rebounding to taking care of the basketball to assisting to shooting. You know, we had a we had a lot of holes uh, last year. We practiced well as a group, but I don't know how much we challenged one another as a group in practice. So uh, this group just across the board, the uh, you know, you get a lot of these practices early. And you only get X amount of games. So there's a lot more practices than there are games. And I think that we're a much better practice team, which is going to help us across all facets of the game. Because you can't, in the game of basketball and, and a lot of sport, you can't just be dominant in one particular area. Talk about, like, I don't know, how, how many returning players do you have? And, like, talk about some of those people that are back uh, who will be contributors for your team. This year. Yeah, right now, early in the in the preseason as well. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, we got to be developing our bench now for when we're going to when we're going to need it later. So I don't think there's any one one over the other type of a situation right now. Again, we've got a couple more weeks to, to really sort that out. We do have a couple of injuries that we're going through, which I'm sure a lot of people are at this point. So as far as rotation and this guy, that guy, I'm not I'm not quite exactly sure. Of course, we have a, a gist of what we're going to do and what that's going to look like. Um, but bringing back six guys from last year's team and uh, I know priest, I don't get caught up too much in the preseason rankings, but being picked seventh, I think it's a great motivator for our returning guys because that's what people thought of uh, you guys that return. Um, in this day and age of college basketball, if you bring back six, seven guys, you would think that you'd be picked pretty high um, just based upon returning people. Um, because again, we're just like all of us, we can't probably name the starters for all 11 teams. You know, it just is what it is. It's a different uh, weird space. So hopefully that's motivation for our guys. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, we got to go out there and do something with it. You got to go do something about it. So six six guys returned from last year's team and uh, bringing in seven, uh, seven to eight new guys uh, this year. That's, you know, there's some teams that only have one or two returning players. So this question doesn't necessarily apply. But when you have, when it's split, how do you balance? Here, here's our new players. Here's our returners. How do you get them to gel during this preseason? Yeah, I think that's a, the, one of the benefits that the, the NCAA or whomever decided to allow us to have summer access. I think that's a great thing, especially, again, in the in the portal era. Uh, you're getting a lot of guys. I think six, seven people every single year is going to be about common. Uh, I think that's going to be the, the general rule of thumb. So to have that time in June and July is really, really important for them to get together, learn one another, learn one another's game, uh, get in the weight room, and really focus on those two aspects more than anything. Um, some guys have class, some don't. So again, it's just a great time uh, for all of us to get to know one another and ease into what is about to be um, a very challenging preseason, which we've had to this point come August. So I really think it's the June and, and July, the summer access has really allowed for that gelling process to happen a lot faster. I know some people just joined us. If you have a question for Coach Corn, let me know down in the chat and I can call on you and you can ask away. Um, let's talk a little bit about your schedule then and how it came together and what you think and uh, how it'll prep you all for a uh, conference. Yeah, I, I think that um, we're a little bit of a, a late add, if you will, to, from the league to be able to go back and, and add another non-division one opponent. Uh, but I think a lot of us are in that space right now just with our bye games. And uh, there's only so many holes really that you can fill and plug with certain games. So uh, we did a, take advantage of that. I'll tell you, Kyle, the, the the toughest schedule we ever had was the the best year we've ever had. So I, I do like this. Of course, we all want to win games, uh, but I also think that um, our guys are here to play and compete, uh, especially when you get into the, the the November, December. It's 
you know, half your haze in the barn uh, as well. So it's, it's time to go play some games and see what you got. So we challenge ourselves in the non-com, which we always will. Uh, we're at Lipscomb. We've got Chattanooga at our place. UMKC comes back to our place. So, uh, and then with our, our kind of our road games, we were, we were able to stay pretty regional. Uh, I thought our travel kind of killed us a little bit a year ago. Uh, so I wanted to stay somewhat regional, get back at a decent hour and, and not have quick turnarounds. And uh, we're in an MTE at Central Arkansas with UNC Asheville. So it should be a really competitive uh, schedule for us. And we're looking forward to that challenge. It's a little bit different this year as well with two conference games starting before Christmas. Is the the regional non-conference schedule is that easier said than done sometimes you'd always hope you could do that but sometimes you just you have to play the games that are available right yeah and i think we're in a unique situation just being in cape Girardeau, missouri uh, there's a lot of places that we can get to whether that's uh, a sun opponents uh, whether that's missouri valley a lot of different opponents that we can kind of uh, i don't want to say pick and choose from uh, but a lot that are our buses and reasonable bus hours you know some of us people in the league aren't maybe as geographically conveniently located as we are with some of those opponents. So from year to year and time to time, uh, depending upon what years out scheduling looks like, you know, we're able to add some of those pieces uh, to the schedule and hopefully give our fans some regional opponents that they can identify with uh, and get some series going back within the, uh, within the state as well. You alluded to it playing a 20 game conference schedule. So December 19th and December 21st, you're going to play games before Christmas and then even have a non-conference game after Christmas. So um, how does that impact your team playing early, uh, a little bit normal, earlier than normal conference games? Yeah, you know, I, I hope it helps with with fans and attendance a little bit too, because that can kind of be the little bit of downtime. Of course, our students will be gone. That's after finals. Uh, so hopefully we can get a little influx of, of people being excited about OVC basketball before the Christmas break. Um, and then just a unique situation, again, with the way that we fall geographically and how the schedule played out. I didn't want to have a 12 to 13 days, I think it was, layoff before we played again. Uh, so to be able to plug that kind of that non in there, really, I think it's going to help us. Again, you don't want to uh, – you're at that point in the year, too. You're about to turn the calendar year. And uh, for our guys to be able to go three, four practices and then play – and then jump back into league play, I think it'd be beneficial for us. So really like the way the schedule worked out. Um, I, I, I kind of enjoy the, the league games before Christmas break. A lot of people, a lot of conferences, of course, as everything continues to shift and change, have gone to that model. So I'm excited to see what that looks like in the, in the league this year. You know, you've been around for a couple of years now. So what are your impressions of, of the OVC? And have they changed maybe from the first year uh, to now uh, on, on what you think about the, the level of talent and competition? Yeah, you know, I, I think the funny thing is, um, Kyle, when I was at SIU forever uh, as a player and as a coach, um, and even when I was at Kansas State, you know, we played SEMO. I think there's only been three years in my whole entire career, whether playing or coaching, that I haven't had some interaction uh, with Southeast. So uh, to be able to keep an eye on the league um, for 20 years uh, has been kind of watch it from afar. I think the thing that our league doesn't get enough credit for is I, I believe if you go back even maybe a year ago, uh, we had a, a every at every position a starter in the SEC, uh, and so it's funny how we don't get a, a ton of, of quote unquote media ESPN type of a coverage if it's not generated by ourselves or the league office. Yet we're still a good enough league and good enough talented players to where SEC schools will come and take our players. So I think it's kind of a unique situation. I think it, I think it was a year ago, Kyle. If you went back and looked at it, I think we had a, a starter you know, not just a player that went to the SEC, but a starter that went to the SEC. So uh, really good, talented basketball. And I, I think that an individualized talent, and you've seen some coaches move on. Coach Spradlin at Moorhead did a great job and then moved on to another job. So if you think you're just going to wake up and just be good because you said so in this league, you got another thing coming. We do. Uh, Luke does have a question. So Luke from KFBS, go ahead with uh, your question for Coach. Hey, Coach Korn. Uh, obviously, I know you weren't able to get uh, SIU on the schedule for this year, but kind of restoring that rivalry with uh, Murray State, how good is it to have them back on the schedule after two years off? Yeah, I think anything with the rivalry is you need to have good competitive games. Uh, otherwise, it's not a rivalry. Otherwise, you're just losing. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully we make it a real competitive game down there, Murray. I know when we played SIU here for the first three years that I was here, we, we lost them in overtime and we had another shot at the buzzer to beat them. Uh, so the really good competitive games. Of course, our fans love that. Uh, we couldn't get them on the schedule this year for whatever reasons. I won't. I won't delve into that. You, know, you can catch me on a on a random night, and I can tell you the real story of what I feel on that. So I'll keep it political. I'll keep it professional. Uh, but we would love to have those regional games. Um, and again, I give Coach Prome a lot of credit at Murray for taking the game. Again, anytime you get in those regional games, even going back to Coach Gates at Mizzou, 
uh, to play us. You don't you don't see that a lot of in within states. Uh, you know, you don't see Illinois State playing Illinois a lot. You don't see, um, you know, interstate schools playing a ton like that. So you got to give people credit when they do take those games and play. And hopefully that's something we can continue to do. Uh, you know, we've got SLU, we've got Missouri State within our own, you know, state boundaries that, you know, and Murray obviously being just down the street uh, in a regional rivalry. But, um, you know, to be able to compete with them uh, the year that they went undefeated, uh, gave that game away a little bit at the end there at our place and then be able to play them in the conference tournament. Uh, so, again, I think we give good competitive games and we're, you know, this year should be no different. Um, since you referenced since uh, Lou's question was about Murray State and the player were your player we're going to hear from shortly, Braxton. He played at Murray State and he came to your program last year. Talk, just go a little bit more in depth on him and and what he brought to your team last year. Yeah, I think Braxton was in a unique situation. You know, he was committed under um, – oh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Coach McMahon, sorry. He was committed under Coach McMahon, and then, of course, the, the coaching changed, and so he stuck with his commitment. So, again, nothing – no ill will there. That's just kind of how things go as far as uh, things getting lost in translation or, you know, styles make fights and – um, you know, just the development as a freshman as well. So I think Braxton learned a ton that year. I know that they didn't want to lose him, uh, but again, it wasn't the, the best situation for him. And uh, I think Braxton got thrown to the fire a year ago, having to play a ton of minutes for us because him and Rob Martin both uh, didn't play a ton as freshmen at the respective schools before coming here. And so uh, I think that's why you see a little bit of our record the way that it was a year ago. They just, that was their first year. You know, they weren't freshmen, but they were playing freshman minutes. So uh, both guys took a huge jump. I think Braxton had one of the best summers, if not the best summer of any of our guys, um, and really is coming into his own as a player, offensively and defensively. So uh, his size, athleticism, his joy, his juice, the motor he plays with, uh, the things that we expect of him, things he expects of himself. Um, he really is one of those OVC guys where you say, yep, that looks like a, a Coach McMahon when he was at Murray kind of guy looked like. So really excited about him. Um, and again, he had a tremendous summer and, and really looking to springboard from the preseason into the, se the regular season. Because he played a ton of minutes. You know, he played a ton of minutes and he he took on a defensive role for us as the year went on. Um, the last couple games of the season, playing Riley Minix, who was player of the year for us, and I believe is on the Spurs summer league team now, uh, took on that challenge and really guarded him and played him really, really well, as, better, as, as good as anybody did towards the end of the season. So really just making, continue to make the progress uh, that he made from last year uh, coming into this season. I know he's a junior, but you always hear the biggest leap from people between a freshman and sophomore. How does that hold up? The big Is there a big leap when you come back to the same school you're at? So he didn't play a lot as a freshman. You anticipate maybe that type of leap since he's back in the system for the second year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I just think that um, nowadays, if you get a guy for two, three years, you feel like they've been, you know, with you for six or seven. Um, and so even Braxton, I, I, we have great relationships with those guys. They got great personalities. Um, so again, that just goes back to more of the fuel of, and again, I'm not too concerned about preseason rankings, but I feel really good about the guys that we brought back, you know, especially Braxton and, and Rob, because they played a lion's share of those minutes. Uh, having not played. And as you said, even though they weren't freshmen, they were playing their first year of college basketball. And as you get into December, January, and February basketball, you're really not practicing the same way you are in the summer and in the preseason, obviously. So you really start to see a deterioration if you're not in that rotation, so to speak, um, even though you're still on the team, of course, and still practicing. Uh, but for a guy like Braxton and Rob and those guys that came back to be able to play their first years with us and really get all that experience in games and in practice, it's really paying dividends. So I uh, just love who, who, what Braxton stands for, who, what he's about as a, as a young man, his family. Uh, those are the kind of guys you want to come back and be a part of your program and represent what is going to be SEMO men's basketball. Last question before we transition to him then. What is somebody, something somebody should know just about Southeast Missouri in general? Not necessarily men's basketball, but the university, just athletics in general. Maybe they don't know. What, what makes it a special place? Yeah, good question, Kyle. I think, I, to me, the thing that I've been, really been able to, to to sit back and reflect on is just how much people actually are just good people here and just they just want to see you do well. Uh, they're not caught up in too much of any of the other things and stuff and uh, what used to be message boards and all that type of thing. They're, they're, they want you to do well uh, and they just want to know how they can help you do well. And a lot of times I think you see a little bit of a divide uh, between the community and the program. It's like, win now, win tomorrow, win yesterday, just win, 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 win. And there's really no meaningful relationship. And I just don't feel that here in this community. People want you to do well. Uh, there's nothing vindictive. They feel bad for if you lose. Of course, we all want to win. We're competitors. Uh, but um, the thing I've been able to notice the most is just how much people just like, 
man, I really want you all to do well. How can I help? Um, and that just, that makes you go a little bit extra. That makes you want to do a little bit more on the days that you don't want to, when you know that you have the support of the people behind you um, and really all pulling in the same direction. Coach, appreciate your time uh, this afternoon and just best of luck to you and your team this season. Thank you, Kyle.